Hello everyone, it is Tyler here back once again with another Assassin's Creed Valhalla video, this time joined by a very special guest, one of the four pillars, Fishy, aka Ethan. How's it going, man? It's going good, thank you. Thank you for uh, for having me on this uh, on this video. Yeah, no, we're going to have a good conversation about Assassin's Creed and I can't wait. Um. <laughs> uh, we, we just had you on the podcast and he has always podcast, so it was like, oh, uh, we can't, you know... Uh, we'll, um, we'll talk about it again soon when we do a Four Pillars one soon, but I'm like, I need to catch up with you uh, as soon as possible and really, you know, discuss with you the things you played and also so much news about Valhalla has come out in the last uh, couple of days. So I really want to get your thoughts on it, give you my thoughts, and maybe we can bounce some ideas off each other and, of course, get your thoughts on the game itself that you played. Of course, it was a, um, a early build, you know, not, uh, not the finished game, build, of course. Yeah. Um, I think it must I, have been a couple of months old, something like that. I don't know, but it was it was just a it was just a demo build. Yeah, and I'm sure we can get a, a, you know enough good stuff out of um, what you played, and of course what what we've sort of seen and heard uh, in news throughout the last you know 24, 48 hours or so uh, through what Ubisoft's released and what other people have played, because of course there were quite a few people that got an quite opportunity a lot to of people, yeah. yeah to play that. Not me, of course, and that's fine. We're not even going to worry about that. They don't like uh, you, Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, they're afraid fun. of what the Tynamite will say. Yeah, they're just like, yeah, they are. This guy, he might, he might knock us. It's, it's a risk. But this fishy guy, uh, he'll just set fire to a group of nuns. That's fine. You are a madman, and that's true. I set and... fire to a group of nuns. <laughs> that is, that is what I have done. You're, you're an animal. You're an animal, but it's fine. It, they pick, they picked you and not me, and it's totally fine. And I'm not sensitive at all. <laughs> yeah, no. When, you, have no to, you have to watch clips like that and remember that there's always a demoist with you when you do when you play the game in like demos I did, and stuff. But dude, I wondered that because I thought to myself, Ethan, I know there's someone watching you play, and you're just sitting there burning nuns like you just yeah. don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a fuck. You're a we're, all catching jo we're all catching jokes, me and this demoist. We're having a great time. <laughs> you know? Alright, so we've got a lot of Assassin's Creed to discuss, and I'm very excited about this. So I'm going to throw some questions at you uh, and, ha and have a bit of a chat, and we'll see what happens. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, I thought the best place to start, would be story. So you said in your preview video that you got an opportunity to play a short story arc. Uh, that happens in Valhalla. Can you tell us anything at all or a bit about that story arc and or at least give us a background of what happened uh, in this story arc? Well, it's it's quite out of context really because I don't have the I don't have the story up until this point. All I understand is that, you know, Eivor's already encountered the hidden ones, already built the bureau in the settlement, which you can do as the player, and um, there's already been some encounter with the Order of Ancients. Um, as for the story itself, it's pretty bog standard. You're introduced to the sons of Ragnar, well, sons of Ragnar is what they're referred to. So we'll just stick with that. And one of them's called one. I forget what their names are, but there's one called Ubba. That's actually one of them. The other one, I forget his name. Uh, and he's the interesting one because he's he, he comes across as like a sociopath when you first meet him like he's mental like he's nuts You know what? I mean? He's literally got hair growing out of the top of his head and then it's parted so to one side and it's got bold the rest of it um, and Half hair he, Well, whatever he is. He's, he's a fucking nutcase even <laughs> And his barber needs him to stop Make the barber <laughs> call stop he needs to um, go to the tattoo shop in your settlement. That's what he needs to do. He needs do. to go to the tattoo shop in the settlement and get it. Get just go bold. What what's the point? I mean, the rest of that I could talk about the details of it, but they're a bit hazy to me because, like I said, they're out of context. All I can say is I can talk about the quality, and that's where I really want to go with this because otherwise we'll be here till the cows come home. And the quality of it is, it's all right, but it's out of context, so I don't know how good it is. You weren't invested yet in what was happening. I wasn't invested words. because it's right. out of context. Yeah. Now, now a question I have, I guess, in terms of story-wise, is you played a uh, this this sort of demo was set in Mercia. Was it east yeah. or west? It was. I would. I don't know. I don't know if. It, well, I'd say it's pretty. It was pretty east, but I mean, as far yeah, I think it was pretty centric actually. To be fair, because it's where the it's where this where the settlement is. It's pretty central to the map like oh right it's... so the settlements actually i thought the settlement must be coastal but the settlements uh it's riverside right it's b beside some sort of like you know water source yeah so it's by a river yeah and it's in mercia central to the map is it it's pretty centric to the map yeah 
Right, um, okay. That's a surprise. I think, I don't know about you, but I th- was assuming it would be sort of in East Anglia. Uh, off the coast. It, I think it's sort. Of, I think it's sort of designed to straddle East Anglia and uh, Mercia, but I think it's in Mercia. Right. I think. And, and that's where the first demo took place, correct? Uh, East Anglia. The East Anglia demo back in July. Yeah, that was. Yeah. that was where that one was, and then this one was Mercia for sure. Were you able to gauge whether or not this demo was set after or before the previous demo you played? I think before. Before, okay. So this was an earlier stage of the story arc, I guess you would say. I think so. But that's the only reason I say that is because on the map that you see in in the settlement, East Anglia had nothing over it. So it wasn't, you hadn't really gone there or anything like that by that point. But then again, they can manipulate it to look at it however which way they want. And obviously there's certain choices you can make in what you tackle first because there are yeah. multiple story arcs. It's come out that there's three main story arcs similar to Odyssey. However, the endings sort of converge. You've got the sort of Viking settlement story arc that I assume mostly centers around your relationship with uh, your Viking f- clan and uh, Sigurd. Then you've got the Hidden One story arc and then you've got uh, Eivor's himself, herself, um, and that story arc. I, w- I mean, we'll get into the himself, herself stuff because a lot of yeah, stuff's coming out about that in a second. It, it's complicated, isn't it's, it? It's necessarily so. It's an yeah. onion. It's an onion. There's some layers to this for sure. There's, there's some definitely. serious layers, and they all make you cry. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's going to be. They do. It's definitely a an colourful onion. discussion. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, like, what what's your sort of thoughts hearing the news about the way they're doing the story or how there's three different arcs? Are you happy with that the same way they did Odyssey? However, there is, of course, they mentioned the endings converge. The way I understand it is, it, at face value, sounds similar to Odyssey. You've got your three different arcs. But did Odyssey really have fucking arcs? It had, no. it had filler. Filler. <laughs> Main story that is also filler. So it just had filler. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. with with Valhalla, what it I think it will be vastly different in the sense that they're going for that they want to go for that Viking episodic drama within. So they want to have that you know. So they'll have stories that embody different aspects of life. So say kinship or fucking courage or some shit. So they'll have all these. So it'll be broken down episodically. So it won't feel like a th- it won't feel like a three part three-part necessarily in any sense because it's not they're not one after the other they're they're sort of parallel i guess um and so they're three different arcs that run through that's probably true and they're probably all broken down into this norse saga uh besides from maybe i would hope for the hidden ones business that's the one that i would hope was sort of different and i'd imagine that's how they'll deliver it so you'll have your norse sagas which are run parallel in different if in different arcs basically and then you'll have your um your hidden ones business that's what i'm hoping but as long as the endings actually do converge then it mat then it, it makes sense to matter you know whereas with odyssey the endings didn't really converge you could end one arc and then end the next and then the next and feel like you could have done those in any order and nothing i i had i had no idea what order was supposed to be like you couldn't tell the end i'm like what order was so supposed to do that i have no idea they're all i don't like, think whatever. you're supposed to actually finish the game i think the entire point is it frustrates you to the point where you turn it off yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, people, people actually, actually get finished the... it. <laughs> yeah, no, I finished Odyssey, and I thought to myself, never again. I, I got to the end and went, I could never play this game again, you know? Um, I did the DLCs, and I vowed to never touch... and I vowed afterwards to never touch it again. I That's couldn't how... do the DLCs. I couldn't. I did yeah, the first no. episode, and then that was it. That was the end. The way Valhalla's marketed, it comes across to me, especially when we talk about these arcs, you've got a clan arc, a hidden one arc, and then they talk about this Eivor-specific arc. I imagine the reason these converge is because at the end of the day, it's all centered around Eivor and who Eivor is and who Eivor is going to become. Because, of course, starting as a Viking, you get introduced to the Hidden Ones, you learn those sorts of skills, you learn that world and discover a lot of secrets. You, I'm sure, are going to have struggles then through England, the different kingdoms, the different rulers, the different lifestyle of being a Viking and... You know, is Eivor the stereotypical Viking or uh, or a bit more of a, you know, about the peace and the finding a home? And does that conflict with family and clan? And at the end of the day, it's all going to be about Eivor. It's Eivor's story. And that's what matters the most. Uh, similar to when you look at uh, uh, the comparison of a recent game like Ghost of Tsushima, where you've got 
of course, Jin's story, and there's different conflicts of being a samurai or being this ghost. So I feel like this might be some of the conflict of being a Viking or being an assassin, and what decision does Eivor make at the end of this game, and where does it lead then to the future of the storyline? I do think that it will get to... I, I, now, this is what I believe was said with regards to the end. Like, I think the end's going to be pretty set, you know? It's going to be set. It's just a case... It's going to be a how-you-get-there situation, and there might be some variation depending on what choices you make, which I think a lot of choices will boil down to... It's not going to be, I choose this this person over this person, or vice versa. It's going to be, I chose to help, or I chose to not. It, that's that's as simple as I think the choice is going to be in a lot of aspects to Valhalla. Um, when it comes to the ending, I think it's going to be pretty hard set, as this is what's happened, which makes me think that it's going to be an assassin ending. You know, like, we're going to have a hidden one ending of some sort. Um, and that's where it will all converge, because it will be... It'll be a complete turning the, the entire idea of every one of these. I think it'll be along the lines of turning these Norse sagas, turning the lessons of them into an assassin ideology of some sort and how it how it blends more into that than maybe being a Viking or maybe, you know, the Order of Ancients if they're involved in any way. And I mean they've already they've already gone I think Diver McDevitt did an interview with Access the Animus where he addressed Sigurd's dark side, I think is what he said. Something along those lines. And when you use language like that, that, that makes me think that um, the main antagonist of Assassin's Creed Valhalla could be right under our noses. And so, and it's and it's and I think that's the obvious choice. It's also something we've been speculating. I mentioned it in one of my previous videos that I suspect Sigurd's dark side will take over. He'll be a more ruthless Viking and, and want that glory and want want that land and want control and maybe want to be a king of his own kingdom when he sees this struggle between kings. And Eivor is not about that life. He's seen the what the hidden ones can bring and what's more important than crowns and what is really at stake and what's really a, a, a um, uh, on the line yeah. here. Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Maybe, maybe with um, Sigurd, he won't necessarily be the main antagonist. But I reckon it will get to a point where he does something, he goes too far, and then Eivor has to well end him basically, because because by this point, I reckon Eivor will be pretty in deep with the with the the, um, the assassins and you know doing hidden one business, and and they'll be like, listen. Sigurd has to go. Uh, and and Eivor will be like, right, okay, but I should be the one to do it, you know? And then that that's what happens. I think that sure I it'll think be it'll be that. Struggle. I think it'll be that. I think it'll be a nice emotional moment. And I reckon it will happen around two thirds of the way through the story, because that's where I'd that's where I'd throw in, you know, the emotional the emotional turn, if you will. Is I'd put it I'd put it right probably right at the beginning of act three or the end of act two but i like i like to think of act two as the you get your ass kicked act um if you're gonna yeah go usually it is thing. you need it you need to sort of fail no maybe you try to kill him at the end of act two and that's where you become a full um assassin or hidden one and then act three maybe is really he tries to kill you him. maybe there you go you're a part of a raid with him he goes too far you challenge him and he tries to kill you for it and because he still sort of worked up on that and then you go back and then the next the, about about half of the next act is just you know you know you just sort of working your way up to to slash him up i mean we could speculate about this this story all day but back to the, the back to the endings and how it's going to converge i just reckon it's going to be a set ending with different variations of minor detail to account for did i help here did i not did i choose to get involved here did i not um, what happened here? Maybe we'll see some some side content play into it somehow. So, if any side content you got involved in, maybe those characters will have something to do with um, the ending in some capacity or another. I don't know. Um, based on the side content that you know I've played in my nine hours altogether with um, both the East Anglia and the Mercia demos, I would say that that probably won't happen because some of these encounters are just completely insignificant and i guess the only real downside to having this lack of side quests now is there's no distinction between the characters that don't matter and those that seemingly do um when it comes to side content uh but i think um it'll be i think it'll be um, a pretty a pretty clean cut ending as far as it will be what i think darby would want I think that's that's where the ending's going, and if it's going that way, then that's not too bad. Um, Darby's because... literally carrying this 
fucking game on his back. Of all the things that have gone wrong, he is carrying it on his back. So I, 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 he's got us in. He's got the fan base in. He's got him excited. This um, community wouldn't be where it is uh, without him. It really wouldn't right now. It's it's on the brink, and he's and he's holding it together. So shout out to you, Darby. Yes. I'm sure there are plenty behind the scenes who are carrying Darby's vision, though, for sure. But he's the one that's marketing it better than well, that's what, the marketing But that's scenes. that's what I mean. Like, it's more about the yeah. like face to face with the community. It's the, it's the face of it. He's the fa- he's the face of carrying Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Behind the scenes, I reckon there's hundreds of people with with minds like Darby's. Uh, you know. And and I I look forward to playing the full thing, you know. Like um, recently, it's just it's it's just got it's just turned exciting, hasn't it? Yeah, it's turned yeah. it's turned exciting, and it's got me excited for the first time uh, at all, really, in a long time. I haven't felt this since like right before. It feels like Origins is about to come out. You know, remember that oh, feeling yeah. where everyone's sort of coming together. There's a lot of positivity, yeah, and man. we all have a good time and enjoy it and come together as a community. That's what it feels like again. And that was a fun time. The best time to be in the community for me was, especially with the four pillars, was the origin, pre-origins, post-origins launch. And it feels like that again, and that's exciting. And I'm excited to be involved in that. Um, but one point of sort of contention, or not contention, but a bit of confusion for sure, comes from uh, Avor's gender. Because, of course, you can pick male or female, but there's also this option where you let the game decide based on what memories are strongest. So it'll literally switch you between male and female depending on what sort of chapter, story, or mission you're playing. What do you make of this, man? Well, when I was in the demo, I chose to let the animus decide. And for the entire six hours, I just played as female Eivor. Right. Uh, so I don't know if it's going to be as clean cut as that. Um, maybe that's just the demo. Let the animus decide which gender you play as for now in this demo. But when it comes to the game, it might switch between which is strongest. And I think, I look at that and I go, I know for a fact that I will select that option. And after maybe 10 hours of playing the game, it will annoy the fuck out of me. And I will then choose which character I think, which version of Eivor I think is strongest. Which, you know, is is you know easier on the ears as opposed to the eyes like the voice and you know if it, which one feels more like they belong it just feels i don't like the option i understand what darby's trying to say because obviously there's some sort of contention on with the modern day connection to and layla's animus to which ivor's which and is it her animus creating simulations of what past events could have happened and how it can be changed that stuff set up from the empirical truth i've got a video on it that explains all of that from assassin's creed origins link in the description uh, so there's a lot of theories that i had from there that perhaps had finally come to fruition here however i just feel from a gameplay point of view i would rather just pick one or the other i'm definitely gonna i i'm not sure 100 whether i'm picking male or female but i'm picking one or the other i just i'm not gonna like jumping between it just annoy the fuck out of me I think I think I think I'll, I want to prove that point myself though. Like I'm gonna prove that it annoys the fuck. I'll let out you of prove. I'll let you prove that. And point. and then I'll then I'll probably as soon as it starts annoying me, I'll ch- I'll choose which character I think carries carries Eivor. You know, carries what what becomes what I think is probably most accurate to be Eivor. Now, I think it's I think um, I don't know. It's really it's a really difficult point because. Considering everything that's gone on within Ubisoft, uh, it's a really difficult thing, isn't it? It's become it's become so complicated um, when it's just a choice. But the choice itself, I think, needs to go for future entries. Just just give us a character, male, female, whatever. You know, write that character. If you want to do a female character, absolutely go for it, Ubisoft. Like, absolutely go for it, and don't. Don't go back on yourself. Don't, because it just it's it's not exactly a genuine approach to this sort of thing. Sure, maybe Valhalla was designed to have male and female Eivor in mind. Maybe it does have a plot plot decision, but the the higher up decision that got you there in the first place is this uh, is is this misguided conception that women don't sell, isn't it? Really, you've got to, you've got to look at the root of that and then go. That's the root, though. So that's why, you know, you could probably not do it justice even if you tried. If anyone can do it justice in a way that makes sense, Darby can. But is it something that re- is it something that you can make sense of? 
and is it going to be important? And if it is going to be important, then why is that not the default? And why can you then just choose to do one or the other and completely skip out on it? If you do that, surely it doesn't make any sense. So how integral to the story is it going to be if you if you can just choose to ignore it, if you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, that's true. It's a good point. It's a good yeah, point. So you, so you can choose to play as male, Eivor, fully. Female, Eivor, fully. Or let the animus decide, and I I worry that the the an the answer to why there's mis well the mystery behind it might not be fruitful. But I can't say that because in the end of the day, I've only played I've only played you know a few hours of a couple of demos in builds of the game that had nothing to do with that sort of mystery. So I'm more than happy to give the benefit of the doubt here and let you know and see what happens when the game launches but i will say this if it annoys the fuck out of me i will take the choice to not bother with it you know what does it actually what does it actually serve to the rest of the story like does it does it branch into it in some way with the modern day i presume or does it just does it just exist for the sake of it as a as a mystery that never gets explained or is it like an empirical the, the, um, the empirical truth we have to go out of your way to find out how it works which would be okay but if it's anything like the empirical truth, then it will just make you want to blow your brains out with a shotgun. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So. You're right. You're right. It's it's. There's a lot of questions, not a lot of answers yet. We're just gonna have to wait and see when the game comes out. Uh, we can speculate all day. But I would like to talk to you about moving on from the main story, but like the side activity. There's a side story. The side content. The side content is the absolute highlight of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Um, I'll explain it in this way. So, we all know that side quests are gone. They've, they've, they've you know, like the traditional side quest, which is tracked in a menu that feels a little bit cumbersome. It feels cumbersome in even the most fruitful of games, like The Witcher 3, where you just get piled on with side quests. You look at them all and you go, that's a checklist longer it's terrifying. than my life. It's terrifying. It's daunting. Yeah. It is. Yeah, it genuinely is. Absolute, it, absolutely horrifying to look at. It's untidy and it sort of bullies your OCD into wanting to do things that you would otherwise avoid. And as a result, your overall opinion on the game goes down. Now that it's inside activities, well, world encounters and mysteries and stuff like that, you no longer have to worry about having it tracked on a log, you know, in, in your face at all times. Um, and that's where that sort of thrives because you can if it's not for you you feel like this isn't going anywhere you can leave it be it'll be marked very subtly on the map where you left it but it won't be in your log clogging it up and so it doesn't feel like something the game wants you to do it feels like it's something the game's put there for you to do if you want to do it and i feel like that little subtle difference is actually incredibly big um, it also makes you not feel like the good quality stuff is going to get lost in the high quality stuff. It's easier to look at it as a case by case thing. It's just one big log of, well, some side quests are good. Others are really bad. Like with Origins, you know, for every good side quest, you had at least two quests which had you just rescue somebody. And with Odyssey, you know what? There were some standouts. There were there were some some quests in that game that weren't terrible. But you had about 20 or 30 fetch quests along with them. And... And so, in a system like that, the high-quality stuff is going to get lost. Because it's being drowned out by stuff that doesn't live up to it. And it's not even sometimes because that's necessarily too bad. The reason why it drowns it out is because when you, apply, when you assign the status of a side quest to something, you feel like it's going to have some substance. So when it's a one-objective thing, one, what, what, one little thing, and it's restricted to the side quest, it feels really disappointing whereas if you're in a world encounter it can go any which way you want there's no quirky title or play on a pun or a or a metaphor or an idiom to tell you where that story is going to go you just have you know your own intuition and your own exploration to see what where that takes you and you don't have any expectation that's set higher than the standard of what you're doing either. That's another joy of world encounters is you don't know if something's going to turn into something else or if it's just going to be a short story that exists and is done inside five minutes. Um, so it becomes very much so a quality, you know, there's, there's no, there's not, they've removed the, they've removed the, the false promise of quality that side quests, I think, like give like, because you cannot gauge how much quality a side quest is going to have 
um, based on the title or just the fact that it's in your log. But the fact that it's there, obnoxiously staring at you to do it and forcing you to do it, makes you think, oh, this has to be something valuable. This has to be something valid. Um, but no, not everything that happens in the game has to be a side quest, nor does it have to be valid or anything more than just one encounter. So when you're not in that system, you feel like there's more. it's more about exploration and less about a checklist. So it lets you feel that sort of discovery in between doing everything. So it it's something that I felt like was promised in Assassin's Creed Origins. They were talking about discovery, discovery, discovery. But to me, it was just full of menus. Your map was full of question marks. And yeah, it, question it, marks I knew, and exclamation marks. I, yeah. I knew that everything in between every single question mark and location was irrelevant and not worth my time. With Valhalla, by them taking all the logs and menus away, I feel like everything I see throughout the world could have potential to be something but it doesn't have a value necessarily on it. The value is what I make of it when I go there. I don't look at it in the distance and go, no, nope, I don't want to do that because it has this logo on it or it's got a highlighted marker for a side quest. It's just, here, here's a building, here's a, an old ruin, here's a town, here's a village, here's some sort of natural uh, landmark. I'm going to go there and explore and see what happens. And maybe there's a side quest there. Maybe there's some loot there. Maybe there's nothing there at all. Maybe there's some bit of lore to explore. And I think that's such a great way to do it. It's a promise that Origins made that it didn't deliver and was a big problem I had with Origins that I feel like this game's delivering. And in a big way, what I've seen from these gameplay demos, what I've seen from your videos, what I've seen from others, I mean, one of... Uh, the one of our friends to rule dylan he put out a video exploring he found an old abandoned hidden ones bureau like just walking into it by accident just walking into that by accident full of all this lore is incredible that's the stuff i want to see that's discovery what is that what's the value of that maybe there's some loot there maybe there was some items there but you there could be none of that there and just lore and that to me is valuable to me because i discovered it, it feels like a unique thing that I found that special to my experience. It's what Red Dead Redemption 2 does so well. It doesn't log you with quests. It's about encounters. It's about the experience. It's about the nature of exploring the world and just finding things as they come along. That's something that Valhalla's taken on board and sort of balancing in between the traditional sense of side quests and this encounter sense of side quests that Rockstar do so well. And I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, no, it is... It is one of those games, you see, when when it comes to the lore and the bits that you pick up as you go, you're absolutely right. Assassin's Creed Valhalla is crammed with that stuff. So you could find a house. There could be no value to this house at all. You go in, nine times out of ten, I think, you're going to find a letter or something that explains the story of what happened here in some in some to some extent it won't be anything huge maybe but it'll be something it'll be something to give that that little derelict building some life and if you're going into a tomb or if you're going to an abandoned assassin bureau you're going to find all sorts of stuff like if, like a writ of evacuation is what you find stuff like that i didn't find it on my on my um in my six hour demo but I, and i thought i'd done most stuff that i could find uh, but it was there. There's always something else as well. So there's always something else that you haven't seen. Now, there, there are two reasons why Assassin's Creed Valhalla's side content, in my opinion, is already at an advantage over that of Origins and Odyssey. One, it's less overwhelming um, because of how it's structured in a way that tells you exactly what you're getting into. And two, it's just better organised. So, you're no longer in a, in a messy log full of side quests, multiple quests added. Look at all these fucking quests, Jesus Christ, stop! No, you've got, you've got, you've got three different things that you can find in the world, usually. Um, there's, I think there's more to it than just these three things. But most content that you can find is broken down into three different icons. So, you've got your blue icons, which are encounters and mysteries and things like that. So, there's a lot of them. You've got your, your gold icons, which are like locations and things like that you can go and have a look at. I don't know if all are marked, but a lot of them are. And then you have your white icons, which are usually within locations, which are like little encounters you can have with merchants, where you can, you can maybe, or maybe an exchange of dialogue, maybe just a trader, um, maybe it'll be a collectible and stuff like that. And there's just so many of those. But you feel like it's vague enough that it's not telling you what you're going to see. Yeah, exactly. It's so vague that it doesn't tell you anything about what you're going to find besides from the locations one, which, ma which makes sense in an RPG 
you know, it, well, I would say RPG, but I feel like that word's, you know, a bit lost. But it makes sense in a game as open as that, you know. In an open world, it makes sense to know where big locations are. So that one's not vague, to be fair, but the other two are pretty vague to the point where you don't know what you're getting into. Mystery, world encounter, they're marked with the same thing. Um, and so I, it's just a better organized side side content system, I think. Um, and it, even when you even when it's marked, it's subtle, so you may not even notice it. Or if you do notice it, it's not in your face like a question mark or a box with an exclamation mark and it's saying, There's a quest here! Everyone do this quest! No, it doesn't do that. It just has this little marker that's just there if you choose to go and explore it. And it's so vague to the point where you don't know what it's going to be. And I feel like that adds into that discovery, even if they're going to tell us where stuff is. Because at the end of the day, it's useful that they point it out, because otherwise we'll just be running around a big map like headless chickens. But they're not saying this is a quest or this is definitely this or oh look a tomb you know they're going it just is what it is go and find out if you want to otherwise don't bother. Tell me tell me a bit about the um, settlement so that's a big piece of I guess I mean it's part of the main story but it's also got so much side stuff to do around it. This is something I'm so so excited about in this game. I love settlement building since Monterey Journey and AC2. The homestead was my favorite part of AC3. All these styles of things where you have a home base, a hub area that's your own, that you feel connected to. It's its own character in a way, and there's lots to do there and really make, uh, you know, when you go out and you collect loot and you go on raids or you complete quests, when you come back to that hub area, it makes you feel like, okay, I can refresh, I can reset, I can buy new gear, I can set myself up for that next outing when I go and explore the world and feel prepared to do that. That's what I've always loved about these sort of hubs, as well as, of course, the side characters. And seeing it grow is really important to that as well, and you know that this is going to happen with the settlement. Tell me a bit about what you saw in the settlement. What were the standout points for you as well? The settlement is it's pretty... It's, there's a lot going on. So, you know, when it comes to the settlement, you're introduced to it early on in the game. Uh, to my understanding, it, there's nothing really there when you first arrive, and you build it. You build, you build that stuff as you go. Now, you upgrade it to a certain point, you bring people towards it, you go off on adventures, you come back, maybe the architecture's been improved, maybe there are new people about, maybe there are new opportunities for you to build more things and expand the settlement. And the settlement is then structured into levels, so the more you level up the settlement, the more opportunities you unlock, the more encampments show up and the more buildings you can place down and the more characters you can meet. When you build these structures, you can then use the service of the trader that's, that, that occupies it. And you can also, I think, start quests for them. Not in side quest form or anything like that, to my knowledge. I, won't, I don't know how this is going to be structured, but I'd imagine it isn't too far off how the rest of the game is handled. Um, but you can essentially form bonds with the characters that you help build up. Um, and it's, it's a hub area for one. But it's all, but it, but it's in the sense that I guess what the homestead tried to be as well, like in it's it's in the vein of Monteregioni and the homestead, and it's got some it's got some serious vibes from elsewhere as well. Um, but I think what it's what it is trying to be is both a hub area and a place where you know you can pick up something new. So it will be it will be a consistency. So you'll have this as a baseline. You can go back to the you can go back to the settlement. You'll find something. You can do that something. And there's always something to do at the settlement, whether it be a simple game of Orlog, you know, you, you create a Yom's Viking, or you um, or you customize your ship, or maybe you do a some form of errand for somebody, or you do so, some sort sort of thing that turns out into something bigger. You help somebody, or you just you know use it to start your raids and you know go we're going here next that's where the quest is taking us or something like that yeah it's a good it's a good way to plan out your approach right so you have your sort of war room and you can decide what sort of story arcs you want to go to what exactly regions that. you want to collect what missions you want to take then you know to upgrading and customizing avor himself your long ship your crew getting to know the characters they're familiar with the thing that it's stood out to me the, the most yeah, exactly. It's that constant. The thing that stood out to me most about the uh, settlement, however, was the addition of the Hidden Ones Bureau in it. Yeah. With a character called Hytham. Hytham, um, that's right. Eerily yeah. similar to Haytham. 
Yeah, no, it's, an easy, it's, it's definitely a nod. That, that yeah, Definitely a nod. Did, who, whoever's idea that was, give them all of the raises. All <laughs> of the fucking raises. That was a good nod. I looked at that and went, yep, yeah, okay, that was that was so easy and on the nose. But it works. <laughs> yeah, it because does work. It's introduced out of the context. Yeah. So yeah. there's no there's 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 no direct referencing or anything like that. It's just a name that's similar. And it just so cool. <laughs> I was just like, yep, okay. So you you've you yourself saw the bureau in your settlement, you saw yeah. Python there. Now what we've heard is that you get assassination contracts and I'm sure different main quest lines to do with the hidden ones from this as well as different rewards are like lore tidbits, I'm sure, upgrades to your uh, assassin skills and outfits, armor, gear, things like that. Did you get to see any of that, or is this just for you news as well as it is to me? Well, well, well when I played it, no, there was nothing like that uh, in, their, in the build. They wanted to save that, I think. But I will say this. The assassination board also overlaps with other activities. So in the world, you may run into these gu these goons called um, I think they're called zealots. Not not from Halo. Don't get confused. But obviously, they're like big they're like big high power level things. They're like the they're like they're more like the Falakitai from Origins than the mercenaries from Odyssey in the sense that their level or power level isn't always gonna. It's not. It's not in any way relevant to yours. So they, no matter where you find them, they'll be stupidly powerful and they'll attack you. These guys are actually members of the Order of Ancients and they'll kick your ass in the demo. But if you actually manage to kill them, you'll trigger a White Room Confession. And so White Room Confessions are back. That's something we know because I watched a video by Axis the Animus interviewing Darwin McDevitt and they went into that, into that depth and they, they spoke about that. And that's really cool. So the assassination board, I reckon it functions similar to the cult from Odyssey, which wasn't a bad concept in itself. It was just a bit much and they didn't really flesh it at all. They didn't really have any flesh to it. It seems like they're going for something similar here with maybe 36 to 48 different targets, but there's a bit, there's, there's more flesh. There's more flesh to it. You hunt these targets down, they overlap with other things, some with the main story, some with the open world just generally. Others you have to go to the board for, and then you have to hunt them down naturally. And I'd imagine they all probably have some form of white room confession, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet money on that. Uh, but with Darby, he fucking loves them, doesn't he? He does, he does, he does like his white room confessions. So I reckon he'd be like, "Do you want me to write fifty white room confessions?" Yes, I, I'll. F I'm already finished. I've done seventy. <laughs> right? No, that. Yeah, no. Um, so that's cool. Um, I didn't get to see the assassination board in action, unfortunately. I'd have loved to. I'd have been that would have been my entire demo. <laughs> it's just hunting down, is hunting down um, the order of ancients and slashing them up. Uh, but I think they wanted you to taste. I think they wanted us to taste the game, and they understood that if that was in the game, we'd get lost in it for hours and hours and hours because there's just so much to it. Um, maybe even in this small area, if there's 48 or so targets, if there's loads of targets like that, I don't know what how that correct the number is, but he, but Darby. We, did say in his uh, interview with Access the Animus, it's somewhere between three and four dozen. So that that gives you a rough idea. It's a big system. So you would get lost in it, even in a small area like that. So it wasn't in there because you wanted, they wanted us, I think they just wanted us to experience a general vibe for the game. Um, taste a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of social stealth, a bit of, you know, combat, which feels better than it looks. Like, I will say that it feels better than it looks, but it, it but it ain't quite carling. Um, if you know, if you understand what I mean, um, and you get you get to experience everything like that. They didn't want to have something that would distract people so much as that would, because they understand that it's in the game. They know that they can wait until people play the game. They shouldn't. They, they are marketing it, but they don't want people to play it because I think they know that a lot of people would play that demo and just get lost in it. Um, and that would just not be so solid for the marketing. I don't think they don't want they don't want to ruin that one for people either. Um, yeah, that that makes sense. That makes sense. But in terms of so in terms of being an assassin though, you got to experience some of the stealth elements. One thing I'd love to point out that I saw in your video was the amazing return of the hidden blade assassination sound effect. Oh, that was beautiful. Yeah. What like an hidden... addition! So simple. Oh, yeah. So perfect. Yeah. Is it? Is it? It. it I think it's air assassinations where it happens, and it, right. and it's such a satisfying sound when you go and you like you're dropping down and you stab someone in the in the neck and you hear that sound and you go, 
I am an assassin, you know what I mean? You feel it. You feel it. You just go, I am an assassin once more. You feel like you're an assassin in that sense. The social stealth, I think there's there's going to be... So okay, so the social stealth is going to require patience. It's going to require you to be patient. If you're not patient with it, you're going to be a bit like me and struggle to get used to it. It's obvious that it work, it functions on a patience-based system because I got detected so easily. But you've got in you have destructed you have distrusted areas where your hood will automatically go up and you're automatically in social stealth mode guards if you get too close they'll detect you if you move too quickly they'll detect you and if you're too exposed they'll also detect you so you've got you've got this hood up you have to blend with crowds sit on benches distract drunks and create diversions you have to interact with the world by doing different bits and pieces and you have to measure your speed you know th th which you're moving as well as how far away from guards you are to make sure that you balance it all out otherwise you'll just you, you will get detected but i think once you've got used to it it will probably be a solid system but i'm not used to it and i'm not the most patient player going in with a lot of things i wanted to taste everything i didn't have time to necessarily sit there for 40 minutes trying to get through one street or something like that um but i did give it a go and i thought you know what i can sit on benches again so it's mm. calm <laughs> it's, it's just yeah it's just the simple things i guess with that social stealth and there's those few additions of distractions and things like that so i'm sure when you have the time to be patient it'll give you a better opportunity to really explore it and maybe it'll be even a little more polished with the detection system Though I did wonder as well, because I saw you go into some parkour elements uh, and some sort of infiltration of a building, is the game built a bit better for parkour stealth? So that when you're sort of entering an area, it's not just telling you, hey, you've got to just fight all these guys. Are you able to sort of climb roofs or ropes or sort of scaffolding so that you can not be detected, be stealthy and actually get away with assassinations throughout a, an interior area? I mean, I did it a couple of times, but I don't think that parkour stealth is necessarily always going to be an option. It's an option in a lot of areas. You can probably get away with it, yes. But in some, I don't think it will be possible due to the density of guards being there, the fact you can't double assassinate or anything like that. Um, but the parkour aspect of the game, the, the game is much more built for it. So in the world design, in the world design, you can you can go further without touching the ground. You you won't be able to go stupidly far because you're still in an open world that is mostly hills and grass and you can't parkour over something that's not there but when you're in a city or any area like that you'll notice that it is a lot more built for that parkour system and uh when it comes to a lot of interiors they have a lot of them have rafters and things like that that you can go through you know stuff high up that you can keep that you can keep you off the ground and then you can pick people off with your bow you can um, create distractions with things like you know you can you can basically throw stuff or you can shoot something that will that'll go kaboom. Um, I don't really like you know sort of similar to the pots in Odys in Origins and Odyssey I think or, you know the ones that just sort of catch fire um, and stuff like that. I'd imagine that's in there somewhere because why would you remove that? And also I think it was I just can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then you can of course assassinate character. Well you can assassinate your, your enemies as well. You have an option for a one shot assassinate. Yeah. I am not the biggest fan of um, of how the game's structured compared to it. I think I will enable that option because, in the end of the day, yeah, it's the OG feel. But I'm here. To, I'm here to play Assassin's Creed. I feel like it's going to cut off the entire point between about a third of all the perks you can unlock. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I don't give a shit about fucking like summoning a goddamn big wolf. I want to fucking assassinate people. What are we doing here? Can I assassinate and people on the back of a big wolf, please? No, don't. Death to no, everybody. Ethan, stop encouraging them. No, I I, I, I appreciate... set fire to a group of nuns. When are they you... going to listen to me? Yeah, yeah, I, they shouldn't. They really shouldn't. The I, only thing you... I have in common with Ubisoft is my lack of love for God. Yeah, how, how, how you're a part of any of this is beyond me. It's beyond yeah. me, but here we are. Here we are. It's, um, <laughs> it's crazy. I, I, I saw that... In terms of the combat, it seems to be pretty drastically improved in terms of polish compared to that first demo you played back in July. Is that yeah, how you'd agree with that? That's for sure. I think the combat, like I said, it still looks uh, a bit off, I think, but it plays better than it looks and it feels better to play. 
um, when you when you're feeling it, you're like, oh, you know what? This is this is pretty responsive. It's pretty nice. You got your stamina base. You got you got your stamina base movement, so you can't just dodge all over the place, and you can't just heavy attack all the time. You've got you've got to time it, and you've got to make sure you have the stamina. Otherwise, you're just not gonna you know just not gonna be able to do it. Um, so you've got that. You've got different enemy archetypes. There's loads, as far as I'm aware. So there's different. So there's so there's the need to sort of step up your strategy and sort of figure out enemy types. And once you've done that, then you can start getting hits off. Um, you've got your archery. You've got weak spots on enemies in archery. So if you shoot them in that spot, they'll, you'll stun them. And then you can stun attack them or you can just do more damage uh, whichever way you want. You have your stun attacks, obviously. You have dual wielding. You can unlock a perk in which you can dual wield big, big weapons. I saw you with fun. a big axe in one hand and a big sword in the other hand. Yeah, no, that was beautiful. That was that was like um, the demoist guided me to that. He said he said, "Oh yeah, there's a perk where you can do this," and I'm like, "Oh, let's sort that out then." And so you can unassign skills in different trees and make sure you get this perk, which I did all the way to the end of the combat tree, <laughs> and I just d did that and started wrecking house with like a big axe and a big sword, and <laughs> I thought to myself, "I am an assassin. Um, I, I am a master of subtlety." Look at all these nuns. They're on fire again. Shit. Yeah, oh, God, you need to stop. You need to be stopped. It's insane. <laughs> no, the combat is... Um, I think it's it's pretty good on the whole. It's got quite a lot of animation variety. There's a lot of variety of weapons you can use, and those attacks look different, and they feel different. And they obviously have value against different types of enemies. Um, one thing I will say is that it doesn't necessarily... It's not my favourite combat system ever in any game uh, by a mile. I think uh, there are some things that just that bring it down a little bit. One of which is the range on which some of your attacks, you know, they feel like they have. So for, especially with lighter weapons. So it feels like at times you can you have, you know, regular amount of range. Not too much, but, you know, enough. You feel like... But other times you'll just hit, you'll just hit nothing, even though there are enemies all around you and you're really close to them. And I look at that and I go, oh, okay, but I'm pretty much in the same range as I was this other time and it worked. And so there's a little inconsistency in that. And that that imbalance in my mind hits me. I don't know if that's just me being silly and imagining it or if there, if there is a difference, then fair enough. But when it when it plays, it doesn't feel like there's a difference. And yet if there's a different outcome. Um, and so it's a bit like... And when that when something like that happens, it feels a bit like the combat system in Morrowind, which is hit, miss, 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 miss. Even though you can see that you're stabbing this man, it says you missed about twenty times before you hit again. Um, and it just feels a bit like that, but you can see visually that you missed, and it doesn't feel that you should have. Yeah, well, it's definitely noticeably better. It's definitely noticeably better, even just from watching it from the build. And I wasn't too worried from that first early build because it was the same with. Origins, when we first saw the combat, it looked not good at all. And even the dodging was an issue, but those are all things that ended up being fixed when Origins came out. And I quite enjoyed the combat system in Origins, to be totally honest. So it's it's encouraging to see at this stage it's already improved drastically, and I'm sure it'll be even improved uh, at least slightly from here to the release of the final game as well, which is, which is exciting, and it's what you'd hope to see as well. Uh, in terms of the long ship and the gameplay mm. that that entails how was that to play uh and is that sort of i, I assume that's all free roam the same way if you had the jackdaw and black flag yeah that's that's about right what's not to love with the long ship it's just relaxing calm and you can sail from place to place and is it efficient you, and quick it's efficient well depends on whether or not you moor it into something but yes if provided you're in the water it's pretty quick yeah and it feels faster than on foot um but if you beach it somehow it, it can take a little while to get out of the mud um as for uh as for playing it you know you've got your your songs and you've got stories that your characters will tell as well and they're both very nice to listen to very fun um and it is just an exploration feature it doesn't really have much value to combat all you can do with it is initiate raids which I think is a pretty neat feature. Again, you've got to point your ship towards the sh well. You've got to point your long ship towards the shore of which you know the target of your raid is, and then you've got to initiate the raid. You'll initiate the raid. You'll just you know you'll do the raid. You can hop back in your ship after and just go along your way, and nobody's gonna bother you when you're in that ship. And I feel like it's a nice, calm way to go from A to B, and 
it's, 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 like, it's like a it's like a breakdown if you will so while you're in it you sort of recharge for the next thing and it's quite neat and those stories and those songs that you can hear will just add to that you can also customize it and i customized it to make it look scary as fuck and i thought yep <laughs> i am a viking now <laughs> that is who i am <laughs> oh that's awesome uh, there's so much there's so there's so much excitement now that I, I didn't feel before just from having a bit more comfort with the assassin stuff in there and the gameplay mechanics and the social stuff but also seeing the improvements in the things that i was a little worried about with just basic graphics the game looks a lot better uh the combat looks a lot better it's beautiful just seeing a bit more having that better understanding of it do you feel better about the game now than you did before i think the game is gonna be pretty damn good yeah i i'm quite confident in that because what I played was good. And I don't see the game dropping anyhow. And I also don't see that being anywhere close to the full thing. And I think we know the writing's going to be strong. Like, I think that was something we were never worried about. It was the it was the gameplay we were worried about. It's, the gameplay, I reckon, will be fine. I will say I'm not a fan of the fact that it's still the same, the same fucking feel as Origins, really. Like, you know, for the most part, most, most systems are intact. It does feel very different, don't get me wrong. You can toggle sprint. You can do little things that make a massive difference. You don't have you don't have checklists in uh, for enemy camps and forts, uh, and it just feels like a higher quality game in that sense. It feels like an improvement by a mile, but I don't feel like we should be still using the same gameplay in that engine as we were with um, Origins. I feel like they should have evolved it by now somewhere somewhere along the lines in in, in a in a substantial sense, which is what I'd imagine they'll do for the next Assassin's Creed game, be it good or or meh. I reckon to be completely next gen, they're going to give it an entirely new it. Not 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 entirely new. It'll obviously still be Anvil, but it'll be a new version, if you will. And so it'll be an, and so it'll be built, you know, differently and run differently is what I'm trying to say. Because in the end of the day, it's always been Anvil with Assassin's Creed, hasn't it? So it's it's you know it's technically it's still bit it's all the same engine just different types of it um different versions different diff, different generations if you will i reckon they'll go i reckon with the next one they shift onto a new generation of um of, of gameplay engine but i feel like this generation it, by the end of valhalla even if the gameplay is good it'll feel like it's starting to outstay its welcome it felt it felt like it was outstaying its welcome in odyssey so that's my biggest criticism with the gameplay is the the generation of engine just doesn't feel like it it doesn't doesn't feel fresh um but everything else in valhalla says otherwise and so i'm pretty i'm pretty excited for it uh i reckon the game's gonna it i reckon the game's due more credit than it's perhaps getting at the moment from people especially in our community who go uh i might i might just leave it and not get it or i might just get it when it's on sale which is fair enough of course but I feel like the game, I feel like the game deserves, um, you know, a good look in at least first, um, because it is, it's got a lot to offer, and I reckon it'll probably be pretty damn good, provided they get most of the narrative stuff right, which is a given, and the hidden one stuff right, which is the, which is the one that we need to make sure. It does seem like there's a lot of assassin stuff in there as well, so, you know, just a wait and see one really. But I reckon it'll do okay. I think we're at that stage now. I, I, I have that Origins feeling again. I don't think it's going to be some uh, amazing 10 out of 10 Etio Trilogy days. We're long past that. This is will be its own thing. We're in a, this sort of Ancients trilogy with the Origins Odyssey now Valhalla. I expect it to be much better than Odyssey and maybe on par, hopefully, better than Origins. And we can then move on to the next era after this on the next generation of consoles. Uh, I guess the last thing I wanted to ask you about before we wrap this uh, sort of discussion interview up was the fantasy elements. It's something I don't like about Assassin's Creed because Assassin's Creed's not a fantasy or never was a fantasy before Odyssey. It's a science fiction, history-based game franchise. But they introduced these fantasy elements, which is ridiculous. Now, in this game, they're using different explanations for it, and it's all, like, hallucinations. But we knew these fantasy elements were coming. So here we see the different realms uh, of Norse mythology, uh, like... Asgard. and Asgard, for example. Yeah. So did you see any of that, and what are your thoughts on those features being inside Assassin's Creed Valhalla? I didn't see any of that, but hallucinations, I did a... Part, I did a... Uh... 
a hallucination challenge where basically you find uh, you find some mushrooms, you eat the mushrooms, you get high, there are seals everywhere all of a sudden in five gates. And those seals point towards the gates and you have to go through all the gates in order um, based on which gate the seal is pointing towards. And it was a fun little challenge, but I didn't really get to explore any fantasy elements beyond, you know, that little challenge which wasn't really fantasy it was just you got high and started seeing seals um i think a lot of um the fantasy elements will be explained off as you're high you know you're just you're just absolutely fucking blazed or you've you've done some psychedelic or or you've just eaten the wrong kind of mushroom or you know you, the sea has brewed you up another one of those another one of those brews you should really stop trusting her she's rude for you again boys stop it um i don't think it's going to be anything too outrageous it's just going to be something that's there um you it'll probably have some form of value to the story in some capacity like you'll do it because it you know the story requires you to one way or the other at some point i reckon a lot of it will be optional but i reckon there will be some parts that aren't but as long as that shit isn't real like you know real real in canon like it's not actually happening like that then i don't really mind too much provided it doesn't go take too much time when compared to the rest of the game um i think it will be handled similar to the giant snake in origins in a lot of aspects which is fine be like that yeah. there'll be there'll be a lot of set pieces like that i reckon but i think they'll mix it up a little bit and make a world space with our with like an asgard um so there'll be a little world space but there won't really be i don't i can't imagine there'll be too much to do there i reckon you'll always go there with a specific objective in mind uh, I, I can't imagine them not doing that. But if they do do that, then provided it's optional completely, whether or not you even bother with it is is all that I think I um, mind. Maybe it will be a part of some character journey with Eivor, where it becomes a realization of their of 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 their purpose, if you will. They get they they get high, they go to fucking Asgard, they see every they see everything kicking off, and they go right, okay, I must become an assassin or some form of way to get to that conclusion you know as long as it has a value and isn't overdone i don't think it'll be too bad they're marketing it they're marketing it which is the biggest indicator that it will be overdone but as long as it has value it will be okay <laughs> you know yeah. yeah for sure for sure if they're, if they're trying to market based on it it means it's going to be something overdone completely but uh, as long as it has value there after the fact then that's all that i guess really matters you know yeah. what I mean? Well, yeah. oof, there's a there's a lot to be excited about. There's still a lot of questions up in the air, but overall, I think we're both looking forward now, finally, to Assassin's Creed Valhalla that drops in less than a month. Uh, Ethan, thank you so much for joining me and uh, being part of this video and filling us all in on on what's going on with Valhalla and what you played. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, it's no problem. No problem at all. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you saw here and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to the channel, like this video. And of course, if I'm sure you're subscribed to Ethan's channel. If you're not, go over there and do that and watch his content that, that he's happen, put out. the question. Yeah, exactly. How did that happen? How um, did that even happen? Sort it out. Sort Link it out. In the description, yeah. 100%. It'll be on screen coming up at the end here as well. Support us over, or well, support me. You have a Patreon as well. Support Ethan on Patreon. Support me on Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash as always. Um, and thank you again for watching this video. And uh, I'll see you guys very soon for more Assassin's Creed Valhalla content. Goodbye.